Welcome to a new edition of The Criminal Library, where we explore the darkest and most complex corners of crime. Today we will delve into the chilling story of Guillermo Antonio Alvarez, also known as El Conchito or El Patavica, a serial killer whose story shook Argentine society. Between 1996 and 1998, Alvarez left a trail of terror in Buenos Aires, executing four brutal murders that included a businessman, a federal police deputy inspector, a student, and an inmate. Armed with fire and steel, this ruthless criminal carried out a series of robberies and murders that culminated in a sentence of life imprisonment, although his release in 2015 generated strong legal and public controversy. From the night of July 27, 1996, when he began his six-hour blood and shooting rampage, to his subsequent release, Alvarez's life and crimes reveal a troubled mind and defiant attitude toward life and death. Law. In the words of Alvarez himself, I steal because I like it, not out of necessity. Robberies attract me, they seduce me. It's like having the cutest girlfriend. Today, in The Criminal Library, we are going to reveal the details of this story that crossed the lives of many people and left an indelible mark on the criminal history of Argentina. From the violent crimes to the controversial ruling that led to his release, we'll explore the psychology, methods, and life of the man behind the headlines. Prepare for a haunting journey into the heart of a criminal mind, in a case that still reverberates in the collective memory. It's not just a crime story, is a reflection on justice, morality and human nature. Now, immerse yourself in the dark world of Guillermo Antonio Alvarez, the serial killer known as El Conchito. We start. Classification, Serial Killer. Features, Robberies. Number of Victims, 4. Date of Crime, 1996 to 1998. Date of Arrest, August 1, 1996. Date of birth, March 21, 1978. Victims, businessman Bernardo Huate, Federal Police Sub-Inspector Fernando Aguirre, student Maria Andrea Carbolito, 24, and inmate Elvio Aranda. Method of crime, firearm, bladed weapon. Location, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Status, Sentenced to 25 years in prison on September 4, 1998. Sentenced to life imprisonment in 1999. Sentenced to 18 years in prison in 2000. Released on December 20, 2015. They order the release of one of the most bloodthirsty serial killers in history. December 19, 2015. Conchito Alvarez was sentenced to life imprisonment for four homicides, but the Court of Cassation said that the sentence had been exhausted. During a raid of blood and shots that lasted six hours, between the night of July 27 and the early morning of July 28, 1996, Guillermo Alvarez murdered the businessman Bernardo Huate, the sub-inspector of the federal police Fernando Aguirre and the student Maria Andrea Carbolito. Two years later, in November 1998, while he was detained in the old Caseros prison, he had killed Elvio Aranda, a fellow prisoner, during a fight. On October 28, 1999, a court unified the sentences and sentenced him to life imprisonment plus accessory imprisonment for an indefinite period. Yesterday, two judges of Chamber 2 of the Criminal Cassation Chamber considered that life imprisonment cannot exceed 25 years and ordered that the serial murderer convicted of killing four people and who admired Carlos Robledo Pook would go free. This means that, in the next few hours, benefited by the interpretation of an article of the Penal Code, the 37-year-old head of the Los Chicos Bien gang, one of the bloodiest serial killers in Argentine history, will be walking by Acasoso. Although he has been in prison since August 1996, with the resolution of the Chamber of Cassation, it was considered that he had served 26 years, 9 months and 16 days and his sentence was considered exhausted. Those six years that would figure more, according to judicial sources, correspond to the part of the sentence that was counted double for the time he spent in prison without the sentence being final. I steal because I like it, not out of necessity. Robberies attract me, they seduce me. It's like having the prettiest girlfriend, 
Alvarez told one of the bus drivers who were taking him to look for the accomplices he recruited to a Bekkar village to rob restaurants. In one of those robberies, which occurred on July 28, 1996, against the company pub, at Miguelitz 1338, in Belgrano, the head of the so-called Los Chicos Bien gang, killed federal police officer Aguirre in student Carbolito. Yesterday, two judges from the Chamber of Cassation argued that it was not appropriate to apply in the Alvarez case, a multiple repeat offender, since Article 52 of the Penal Code considers it unconstitutional. Said norm indicates that indeterminate imprisonment will be imposed as an accessory to the last sentence, when the recidivism is multiple in such a way that there are four custodial sentences, one of them being over three years. In order to found the unconstitutionality of the aforementioned rule, the judges consigned an agreement of the Supreme Court of Justice, in the so-called Gramajo ruling. With this argument, magistrates Angela Ledesma and Alejandro Sloker revoked the decision of an execution judge who, in March 2014, had set the time limit for the sentence Alvarez received for the four murders at 37 years and six months. The chamber members considered that this rule should not be applied, since it was not in force at that time. In 1998, Alvarez received the first of four convictions. The San Isidro Court of Appeals sentenced him to 25 years in prison for the murder of businessman Huate, son of a former minister of public works in the government of Alejandro Lanús. In 1999 he was sentenced to life imprisonment for the killings at the company pub. The following year he added a new sentence, 18 years in prison for the murder of Aranda in the old Caseros prison and had two sentences of six months in prison for escape attempts. Alvarez's defense had filed an appeal against the decision of the criminal execution judge. Then, when analyzing the defense proposal, Judge Ledesma maintained that, in the face of two possible interpretations, the magistrate should lean towards the most favorable one for the accused. Last night, Alvarez was able to leave the Gualaguaychu prison, where he served the last part of his sentence due to the impossibility of housing him in a federal penitentiary service prison due to the two escape attempts that he carried out. For a security issue, they took him to Entre Rios. Before being released, Alvarez had to go through a federal police unit, where he must verify that he had no pending case. Only his admired Robledo Puck killed more people than him. Cesar Umberto Girardi, another multiple murderer released a month ago, was convicted of as many homicides as Conchito. When he was arrested by personnel from the Beccar police station, under the orders of Commissioner Jorge Avesani and by a group of detectives from the Homicide Division of the Federal Police in August 1996, they found in his possession newspaper clippings with news about Robledo Puck. In the chalet where he lived with his parents, Alvarez kept a folder with the publications of the restaurants that he had robbed and the homicides that he had committed. He boasted of having blown up a place where Susana Jimenez and Huberto Rovaralta were. Alvarez, whose father had two cinemas and a commercial gallery and attended the best schools in San Isidro, recruited his accomplices in the Villa La Cava, in Bicar. He took advantage of his good looks to get into restaurants, posing as a customer and doing intelligence. Later he returned with his accomplices, who broke into the premises armed and carried out the robberies. Did you see the robbery in Belgrano of the confectionery company? It was me. I stole it. I can't believe I got downgraded to a mate. The cop betrayed him, but I have the peace of mind of having avenged the death of my partner. I went in and shot him. I emptied the magazine. I shot him seven times in the back and three in the head, Alvarez admitted and shamelessly confessed, according to the taxi driver's account. Gunslinger for six days. June 7, 2009. A young man with an excellent social position decides to venture fully into the underworld. In less than a week he commits a raid of armed robberies, in which three people are killed. Guillermo Alvarez was 18 years old, enjoyed an excellent social position, lived in San Isidro, and had had an unhealthy tendency towards violence since childhood. He worked with his father. On weekends he attended a kiosk located in one of the pornographic cinemas that supported the family fortune, although they preferred to hide it. He was disciplined and never missed his homework. 
He showed himself at school as an irrepressible young man and at home he did not pay attention to limits, for dealing with his brother and the domestic workers, whom he mistreated inconsiderately. He lived in a luxurious villa in Akasuso. His penchant for violence and transgression ended up sending him to the Villa La Cava, where he began to cultivate his friendships. He was dazzled by the boys who, at just 13 years old, were beginning to make their way in the underworld. He felt an irrepressible inclination to crime. A special adrenaline engulfed him every time he heard the story of a robbery involving blood and bullets. His new friends nicknamed him, El Conchito, and he began his career advising them on the value and importance of stolen objects. Especially jewelry and watches, world brands, indicating where to sell them and how much to ask. He met the boys from the villages of La Cava and Urquiza in a gym where he used to go every day to learn boxing. One afternoon they all went out to tour Villa Urquiza and from that moment on they felt like one more among them. He began to be fascinated with the stories that the youngsters told of their robberies, street outbursts, and in some cases armed robberies that ended in a shootout. That's what I want to do, he repeated to himself in silence. Like most of the things he proposed in life, Guillermo gradually incorporated into the criminal landscape of the town. For the activity in which he wanted to excel, he had a great advantage. He was a weapons expert, like his father. The Alvarezes often traveled to the countryside to enjoy their hunts. Guillermo distinguished from that moment every detail of a weapon. He was at that point a true connoisseur in the matter. He would be of great use to what he proposed. He dropped out of school after making a pilgrimage to the schools in the area. He dedicated himself to studying guitar, taking classes with a private teacher. In this way, he decompressed the difficult family situation that he had due to dropping out of school. He calculated down to the smallest detail. In the guitar case he would transport the weapons, to use in his new job. His itinerary was an easy routine to guess. From the Akasuso mansion he moved to La Cava and from there to the center to his father's cinema. On July 27, 1996, the misdeeds of the gang made up of El Conchito, Alvarez, El Ocido, Alberto Reynoso and Cesar Mendoza began, with bolio assaults in San Fernando and Martinez, places very close to Guillermo's chalet. In all the assaults money in the car were stolen urgently, preferably when the members of a family arrived at their homes. All the victims declared that one of the members of the gang was blonde with a very good appearance and that he did not look like a criminal at all according to the stereotype they had of them. The blonde was none other than Guillermo Alvarez. On the night of July 27, 1996, they decided to rob the famous Harry Siriani restaurant, located in Recoleta. They had stolen a Mercedes-Benz car, which would be driven by Guillermo. Alvarez entered the place first, dressed in a rigorous suit. Then his accomplices tried, but without luck. Both were rejected by the restaurant guard, with the excuse that they had not made reservations. Standing next to the bar of the business, Guillermo pointed his revolver at the manager, getting him to open the door for his henchmen. In a few minutes the trio fled the place with the shipment of watches, wallets and jewelry. They left with the police behind. A few minutes later, the Alcorta Y Tegel restaurant was assaulted. They picked up the loot and exchanged the car for a customer's Honda with which they headed back to the village. The madness already had a starting point. A day later they went out to rob the streets of Martinez, surprising the businessman Bernardo Huate together with his family, at a time when he was guarding his Volkswagen Passat car. When the trio approached to ask for the car, Huate resisted. Alvarez shot him twice in the chest and killed him instantly. They hid their weapons in a dump and returned to the villa, where Guillermo delighted in distributing medals, chains, and valuables among the girls. This time, however, they brought the charge of murder. The police, until then obsessed by the gang's criminal raid, put all their troops behind them. In Belgrano they had reinforced the guards at the restaurants, all savagely assaulted by the blonde and his two dark and disheveled accomplices. On July 28, a day later, they decided to assault the company bar in Belgrano. In their style, 
In a commando coup, in less than three minutes they loaded up with everything their clients had. When they were about to leave, a plainclothes police officer shot seriously wounding Osito Reynoso. The offender remained motionless on the floor. Guillermo retraced his steps and executed the policeman Fernando Aguirre, who was with a friend at the scene. In the shooting, a young woman who was having a smoothie in the bar died, Maria Andrea Carbolito. Alvarez and Mendoza charged with Reynoso heading to the San Luca Clinic in San Isidro. They threw him out of the car at the gate. He came in dead. Guillermo and Mendoza attended the wake the other day in Villa Urquiza. The plainclothes police infected the area. They filmed the attendees, including Alvarez. Guillermo used to travel from his house in Acasuso to the town in cars belonging to a remiseria and boasted about the criminal adventures he had just begun. The drivers were key when looking for data on the blonde who drove the cars. On August 1, six days after he started in the underworld, he was arrested. A race as bloody as short. He had three homicides to answer for. The parents, incredibly, were not surprised when they received the news. I thought my son was into drugs, because of the guys who called him, but never in one of these things, said the mother with a coat in her hand, waiting her turn to hand it over to Guillermo. In jail he killed an inmate with a spike, fighting for the leadership of the war. When everything seemed to have been experienced in prison by a 22-year-old from a wealthy family in Acasuso, he asked to testify before Judge Susana Lopez. She told him that the prison guards, in exchange for going out to steal and distribute the loot, commissioned her to kill Judge Alberto Banez who was investigating the penitentiary service for corruption. He declared that they gave him permission to go out and steal and keep 20% of the loot he obtained. The remaining 80 was handed over to the prison guards. The revelation was a national scandal, they sent him to be beaten by other prisoners and he had to be transferred to the gendarmerie, to save his life. Guillermo fulfilled his long-awaited dream as a gunman for only six days. During that time, he killed three people and ran around fascinated by shooting with the police. Since then he has been in jail, paying for a short life of six days. Convicted of four homicides, he fears they will kill him in jail. May 12, 2003 He lived in a chalet in Akasuso, but he led a band of marginals. He was convicted of seven assaults and three homicides. He then returned to kill in jail. He says that the guards will kill him because he denounced them. When he was not yet 21, in September 1998, an oral court in San Isidro sentenced him to 25 years in prison for a series of assaults and the murder of a businessman. Shortly after, another court, this time in the capital, imposed indefinite detention on him as responsible for a new string of beatings that ended with the death of a policeman and a 24-year-old girl. The third sentence against him, to 18 years in prison for stabbing an inmate in the Caseros prison, no longer surprised anyone. In prison since 1996, Guillermo Alvarez, 25, known as El Patavica, due to his love for the gym, or Conchito, he grew up in a charming chalet in Acasuso, never wanted to tell his story. What led him to change the routine of private schools for the violent experience of integrating and according to the justice leader, a gang of thieves formed in the northern villas of the Buenos Aires suburbs? Alvarez never answered this question. But now he wants to talk because he is afraid of being killed and that convinced him to give an interview for the first time. Detained at the gendarmerie premises in Campo de Mayo because in 2000 he denounced that Caseros prison guards took him out from time to time to steal, he fears that, due to a recent order by the Ministry of Justice, they will transfer him to a prison in the Federal Penitentiary Service SPF. In the gendarmerie we live three prisoners who testified before Judge Alberto Banez against the SPF, in addition to Alvarez there are Alejandro Penksansky and Alejandro A. Bear Nunez. And one of them has already signed the pass to Isaiza. It seems that the gendarmerie is not going to house any more detainees. I am sure that if they send me to jail they will kill me, Alvarez told Claren. Are you convinced of revenge against him? Because of our denunciations, 
an entire dome of the SPF fell and they placed a bomb in the courts of a secretary. If that happened to an official, what awaits me in a prison when the lights go out? Is it true that he paid $90,000 for a botched escape? Yeah. It was going to be from the Panero Hospital. When I returned to Caseros, the penitentiaries, who did not know that it had been an arrangement, kicked me to death. In the SPF everything is fixed, whatever you want. Between 99 and 2000 I got out of jail several times to steal. How did he start to leave Caseros? They offered it to me. First they give you the suite. They present it to you as a chance to make money, of what you steal, 20% is up to you. But in the end, you don't get much because you have to use that money to pay the penitentiaries another way out. And that cost between 40,000 and 50,000 pesos. Was he going to rob with penitentiaries? Of course, they were not going to leave me alone in the street with a weapon. They took you and guarded civilian cars. As an excuse to get me out of jail, they took turns for treatments at the Panero Hospital. But I never made it to the hospital. The talk continues to review his life. While music comes out of the computer which the Banyas court authorized him to install, and his cat, Tito, sleeps on one of the chairs in the cell, El Patavica drinks mate and tells, how to explain the inexplicable. I was an asshole, for me everything was like a movie, an adventure. I ruined my life and they ruined it for me too, he summarizes. His stance, he admits he was in a gang and was in shootouts but denies killing anyone. I am not a murderer and I want the families of the victims to know it. I did not kill those people, he insists over and over again. You present yourself as a victim, but for justice you are a murderer. I think I was not well defended in the trials. I do feel responsible for the homicides of the two causes for which I was convicted. I was the only one in the gang who knew how to drive and if they hadn't counted on me to get to the assaults, those people might still be alive. I'm not saying they shouldn't have sentenced me, what I'm saying is that I was no more than a participant in the homicides. When did you start stealing? At 15, 16. I didn't have good meetings and on top of that my parents were separating, they were in their world, fighting over certain things. It was gradual. It's not that one day I got into a car, grabbed an iron and left. One thing is leading to another. But how did it start? I went to a gym, practiced boxing and there I linked up with people totally different from the one I treated, kids from La Cava, Villa Uruguay, Boulogne. I joined them as an act of rebellion, of courage. I had great respect for them. I had grown up in a bubble and suddenly I trusted these people, I went to their houses, I met their families. I always traveled in Remus and with them I had to put the little coins for the buses. At one point, since I knew how to drive and they didn't, they told me, will you take us to that side? And so began the issue of robberies. I had handled weapons since I was a child, because he went hunting, so I was not afraid to grab one. According to justice, you were the leader of the gang. That is not true. I didn't even know how to clean my sea, and they were bigger than me. He did fulfill a more thoughtful function, first reselling them the things they stole or advising them at what price to sell them and then giving his opinion on whether this or that coup was safe. But in many things he could not even comment. During the two hours of the dialogue with Claren, Alvarez tries to reverse the homicidal image of him. He introduces himself as a distance computing student concerned with good conduct and thus getting his sentences commuted. I didn't realize what he was doing. In part he also tempted me the easy life, the easy money. That attracts you even if you say no. I was stupid, because of my position it would have been more coherent for me to be a fraudster, is Alvarez's curious conclusion. The story of a murderer with the face of a good boy. September 6, 1998. What did he do now? If he did something, let him pay for it. Viviana San Roman's voice sounded somewhere between worried and angry on the phone. On the other side, the commissioner who had arrested her son a few hours before tried an explanation. 
they accuse him of having assaulted the company pub, in Belgrano. It's something heavy, they killed a policeman and a girl. A thief also died. It was the night of August 1, 1996. The policeman had Guillermo Alvarez, then 18 years old, in the cell of the Beccar police station, the young man sentenced on Friday to 25 years in prison for murdering engineer Bernardo Huate to steal his car. And that now he awaits trial for that assault on company. The story of a surprising criminal began to unravel. The one who with his good boy face went from spending the summer in Punta del Este to committing more than 15 assaults leading a gang of marginals. Alvarez was born on March 21, 1978. He had everything to succeed. The businesses of his father, Alberto Alvarez, owner of a chain of cinemas, several of them dedicated to showing erotic films Dash, allowed him to live in one of the most exclusive areas of San Isidro. And they assured him of a weekend job at the Avenida Cinema Kiosk, on Avenida de Mayo at 600. Last Friday, a movie employee confirmed this information to Claren, while placing the ad for Top Models, an exclusive film for adults. What he did not say was that Alvarez tried to use that job as an alibi during the Wate murder trial. Together with his brothers, ages 13 and 17, and his mother, Alvarez spent his entire life in a spacious and luxurious two-story villa at 1000 Las Eras, in Acasuso, where he was finally arrested. The embroidered tiles, the wood paneling and the garden of the house stand out in a street full of imported cars and security guards. But since before 1996 not everything was happiness for Guillermo Alvarez. His parents divorced at the beginning of his adolescence, one of his brothers had problems because he was deaf and there was no private school that could support him. He did primary school and part of secondary school at the San Patricio de Acasuso School. According to some of his former classmates, he was the chubby one in the grade. But everything began to change when he was in his third year. He decided to dedicate himself to changing his physique, he signed up for a gym, went jogging and learned to play tennis. Thus he managed to lose 10 kilos and shape his 6 foot height. There are neighbors who still remember the first time they noticed him, we had an argument because he was shooting cats with a compressed air rifle, one of them said. During that metamorphosis from Chubby to Patavica, he was kicked out of San Patricio for bad behavior. He had to continue studying at the Estrada de Acasuso and then at the Fatima Institute, which also expelled him. Alvarez was already 16 years old and his visits to the bodybuilder's Gym Santa Fe at 1100, Acasuso were more and more frequent. He started doing apparatus and then full contact, mixing boxing with karate. It wasn't very constant. He came with friends, who disappeared after what happened, Diego Celestino, manager of the gym, told Claren. According to Celestino, no one in the gym knew what Alvarez was up to. According to the police officers who investigated him, he had already begun to steal motorcycles, cassette players and small things. But he got heavier when he got together with people from the village of Uruguay and La Cava, both from San Isidro. The contact was made in a brothel in the area, where he frequented two prostitutes. There he made himself known by telling anecdotes about his thefts. He said that he was banking on it, that he could show that he was handsome. So they took him to the village and he began to rob people there, the investigator said. Alvarez soon exhibited his ability. He made a lot of poster. After the assaults, he would enter the villa and distribute watches, chains and other things. He was in the imported cars that he stole. That's why they started calling him the Conchito, said the policeman. Between the ages of 16 and 18, the length of his criminal career, Alvarez perfected a technique. He recruited people in the towns of San Isidro and gave them a plan. They went to restaurants in imported cars and he always went in first. He was shown in a dark suit and overcoat and sometimes carried a guitar case with weapons. He didn't look like a thief, but he also didn't have the Clark Kent look that he wore at the Wate murder trial. Once in the chosen restaurant, Alvarez sat at a table and observed the place. If he seemed right, he would open his cell phone and summon his accomplices. During the robbery he was controlled and cold. 
and he did not hesitate to shoot. It is believed that he was the one who shot a policeman with three bullets in the assault on the company pub on July 28, 1996, and who left another paraplegic in a shooting at the Cameroon bar. The photos of these police officers that Claren published were hanging in Alvarez's bedroom when investigators raided his house. I knew he was up to something weird. He called him people who were not like him, his mother told the police that day. A new crime by the head of the good guys gang. March 25, 1999. In jail, this is Guillermo Alvarez, who is accused of having killed a prisoner in the Caseros prison. Nothing and no one seems to be able to stop him. After killing Bernardo Huate, Federal Police Sub-Inspector Fernando Aguirre and Maria Andrea Carbolito, the man went to prison, where he is now accused of murdering a cellmate in cold blood. This is Guillermo Antonio Alvarez, alias El Canchito or El Caratica, designated by the police as the leader of the Good Guys Gang, which devastated elegant Buenos Aires restaurants between June and July 1996. On September 4, Chamber I of the Criminal and Correctional Appeals Chamber of San Isidro sentenced him to 25 years in prison for considering him criminally responsible for the murder of businessman Bernardo Huate, which occurred on July 27, 1996, in Martinez. Before the court read the sentence for Huate's crime, Alvarez had shed tears when he heard the statement from his mother who, in vain, tried to convince the court to change the image it had of her son. He then became emotional again when he read a handwritten letter from his girlfriend. They were the only moments when Alvarez put aside the poker face he had shown during the trial. But the facts continued. On November 15, there was a brawl in one of the pavilions of Unit 16, the old Caseros prison, where prisoners under 21 years of age are housed. During the fight, an inmate died, who, according to judicial sources, would have been identified as Elvio Aranda. They had pierced him with a knife, the name given to the bladed weapons made by the prisoners. The Federal Penitentiary Service was in charge of the investigation that had Guillermo Antonio Alvarez as the main suspect, who was waiting in prison for the oral trial for the murders of the policeman Aguirre and the young Carbolito, which occurred on July 28, 1996, in the pub company. According to the testimonies collected by the prison agents, Alvarez and Aranda led the two groups that disputed the leadership of the pavilion. A few days before the crime, Aranda and his accomplices cornered Alvarez in the patio and beat him. Out of his mind, Alvarez, the well-dressed and well-mannered boy who attended secondary school in San Isidro, would have sworn revenge against his attacker. Now, justice is investigating whether, indeed, Alvarez kept his promise. Initially, investigating judge No. 41 Daniel Torano labeled the case as homicide or injury, because, although it was established that the defendant participated in the fight, it had not been determined whether Alvarez was the author of the fatal blow. After receiving the results of the expert reports, the magistrate prosecuted him for the homicide, according to sources from the investigation told La Nación. Currently the case is in the hands of forensic doctors, since the lawyer Victor Stinfail, defender of Alvarez, asked that the injuries suffered by Aranda be analyzed to try to establish if they correspond to the murder weapon. The penitentiaries persecute my client and accuse him without foundation. They accuse him that he killed with a saber, when Aranda was killed with a knife, according to witnesses. In addition, we have carried out studies to show that he is not criminally responsible and that he suffers from psychopathy, Stinfail said. The day before yesterday, Alvarez turned 21 and left the relative tranquility of the old Caseros prison to go to Unit 1, for the elderly, very far from the luxurious family chalet at 1000 Los Eras, in Acasuso. Too scared to speak. May 4, 2000. Accused of a murder in prison, Guillermo Alvarez, nicknamed the good boy, refused to testify at the trial. But his intimidation also silenced witnesses. A terrified prisoner admitted that he had received death threats from Alvarez himself and began to cry. Suspicions about the SPF. I would like to say the same thing that I declared before, 
but I am very afraid, admitted before the judges Mario Cruz Cordoba, 20, detained in Unit 24 of Marcos Paz and witness for the prosecution in another case for homicide in which Guillermo is involved. Alvarez, the good boy, sentenced to life for another double crime. Stammering, the witness ended up breaking down without reiterating his accusation against Alvarez, to whom in the investigation he accused the authorship of the death of a prisoner, in 1998, in the old prison of Caseros, from an accurate knife to the heart. Cruz Cordoba confessed, before beginning to cry, that he had been threatened with death, by means of a note, by Alvarez himself. The complaint led to the opening of a case to investigate the alleged intimidation and the court order to the Federal Penitentiary Service SPF, to guarantee the safety of the detainee. The defense of the good boy rejected the complaint, while an official source told Pagina-12 that it is impossible that Alvarez could have carried out the threat without internal support from the SPF. In April, the defendant admitted before the justice that he had the possibility of escaping from prison after paying 90,000 pesos as a bribe to prison staff. The surprising testimony of Cruz Cordoba was the culmination of a first hearing in which fears and rectifications regarding the initial statements abounded, as also happened with the witnesses Domingo Citraro, Eduardo Sobre Pereira, Raul Iarbi, and Alberto Monzon who directly he refused to testify even though he was informed that he could be accused of the crime of false testimony. Do you swear or promise to tell the truth, the president of Oral Court 12, Carlos Bruno, reiterated several times, who arranged an intermission room to convince him. Nothing produced the expected effect and Monzon was summoned again for today. What had Cruz Cordoba and Monzon declared during the investigation? The first maintained that on Sunday, November 15, 1998, at 1.20 p.m., in Pavilion 1 of the old Caseros prison, the only one who had a faca, knife, in his hand was El Patavica, as Alvarez was called, with fear, his cellmates. Cruz even assured that he saw how Alvarez, pricked him in the chest, next to the heart, to the inmate Elvio Aranda, who died instantly. The prisoner, silenced by panic, even specified that the knife was a 40 centimeter long iron. Monzen, in the same way, had indicated without hesitation that Patavica handled the murder weapon. Yesterday, however, Cruz had to be led by the hand, like a child, to make him confess what was obvious, that he had been threatened. I heard Patavica name was one of the first sentences he let out through his teeth, disconcerting the judges. He was sleeping, watching television, sick, I went into the bathroom, I don't know which ward they were from, were other indications that something strange was happening. He is afraid. Ask Judge Bruno. Yes, Cruz Cordoba admitted for the first time. Why are you afraid? Insisted the president of the court. I don't know what to tell you because I can't talk, replied the witness in danger. With the confusion growing, Cruz first suggested that when he declared in the investigation he was empistolado, drugged, but then he admitted that he remembered very well everything he had said and bared his sorrowful soul, I would like to say the same, but I am very afraid. Then he recounted that a few days ago, summoned by another judge in the Comodoro PY courts, another inmate read into his ear a letter in which they demanded that he change his statement against Alvarez. I had to, at the price of my life, he said, his voice choked with the rising fear of him. Regarding the textual version of the note, he said, I don't even want to remember. Do you know who the author of the threat is? Bruno asked. Yes, Cruz answered after a very long silence. Is he here in the room? The head of the oral court 12 thought he guessed. Yes, Cruz admitted after another interminable silence, but then added that the name was in the file read at the opening of the trial. For a formal matter, Bruno first mentioned the names of Gonzalo Pazzo, 20, and Hugo Schmidt, 21, co-accused of the murder of Elvio Aranda, until the definition came, Guillermo Alvarez is the person you are referring to. Cruz's, yes, was a sigh that preceded crying, long and silent, with her head bowed, facing the judges. Bruno instructed the head of the SPF guard to guarantee the safety of the prisoner, who must be taken, as he himself requested, to the F pavilion, 
the safest, of Unit 24 of Marcos Paz. Teodoro Alvarez, lawyer for the good boy, said nothing at the hearing about what Cruz said. He later declared to this newspaper that his defendant could never have threatened him because since November 1998 they have been in different jails. Regarding the threatening note, he questioned, the witnesses are pressured by the SPF to incriminate Alvarez, it is impossible for a letter to get that far without the help of the guards. The story of the good boy, Guillermo Alvarez, is a disturbing and dark narrative, full of crimes and mysteries. His criminal career, marked by violence and revenge, took him from elegant Buenos Aires restaurants to a life behind bars, where his thirst for power has not diminished. The trial and the charges against him have revealed a fearsome figure, capable of inspiring fear even among witnesses. Alvarez's story is also a reminder of the dangers and challenges that judicial and penal institutions face in the search for justice. Corruption, threats and intimidation intertwine in a web that threatens to obscure the truth. If you have been fascinated by this case and want to continue delving into stories as intriguing as this one, don't forget to subscribe, like and leave your comments. What do you think about Guillermo Alvarez and his criminal legacy? Do you think that justice will be able to get to the bottom of the truth in this complex case? Your opinion is important to us. Until next time.